Okay, I think it's time to start. Welcome everybody, my name is Dagmar Zunniken. I am a professor in the School of Public Policy and I'm cross-appointed to the Law and Society program. I'm obviously not Sean Rehack, but Sean had to be at a meeting and has asked me to introduce <coughs> our speaker for the week on behalf of the CRS executive. Um, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce um, Dr. Anna, Anna Perkey, who did her PhD, we were just talking about this, at McGill University with somebody who I happen to know, and then um, did a postdoc, has also worked in government, which I found very fascinating, and who is um, here to share her new book with us that's called Refugee Dignity and Protracted Exile, and you can obviously see it over there. And um, she will start with the land acknowledgement, and then she, she will change to her talk. All right, so first, as is customary here at York, we want to recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which New York University campuses are located that, pre that precede the establishment of York University. And York University acknowledges <coughs> its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong, okay. Kagronto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of Credit Nation, First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So on that note, I did act in fact have the book up in my office and managed to forget it. So um, you're gonna have to, there is a picture of the book. It does exist. As of last week, I have it in hand. Um, now, I, uh, when I was working on this, uh, on my doctorate, which is the basis for this book, I came across a short video that made quite an impression on me. And the video was produced by a small NGO called Burma Link. And, um, it, it's an NGO that works in the Burmese refugee camps on the Thai Burmese border. And with ongoing political reform in Burma and a lot of sort of movement on the political stage, there had been rumors circulating within the camps for quite a while, for months if not years, that there was a plan to shut down the refugee camps and push everyone back across the border into Burma. And these camps had been there for uh, 30 years and plus in many uh, situations. And so the video showed um, uh, footage of resettlement camps that were being quietly built within Burma. And it, it showed interviews with UNHCR officials and um, Thai officials who pleaded ignorance. The main theme of the video was the frustration and the anger that members of the refugee community <coughs> were feeling that these actions were being taken without any consultation or even notification. And the title of this video was Nothing About Us Without Us. I warn you, this was a last minute PowerPoint, thanks to Michaela, who said that I needed a PowerPoint, so he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it, so it's mostly there. I've seen a few slides, but bear with me. So this sentence, Nothing About Us Without Us, has long been a slogan of various advocacy organizations and movements and highlights the core idea that each and every person regardless of your legal status, your physical ability, your gender, your sexual orientation, your ethnicity, your religion, your, each of us possess inherent human dignity. And that that dignity requires that we be treated in a particular way by others, by other individuals, by non-state actors, and also by state actors. Indeed, it's a key component of human dignity or of our understanding of human dignity, that all humans should be able to exercise some degree of control over the decisions that most closely affect their rights and interests their, and their sense of self. That individuals should be able to be active participants in their own lives, to exercise their individual agency. Now, as the, in the case of Thailand, Refugees often find themselves in situations of profound indignity, where their rights exist only on paper. When it comes to respecting the inherent uh, dignity of refugees, ensuring essential needs and minimum uh, standard of treatments, which is the <coughs> traditional humanitarian approach, 
is really inadequate, not because that framework doesn't produce beneficial outcomes, it certainly can, but because it fails to recognize individuals as rights bearers as opposed to merely being objects of charity. So the starting point of this research was simply that, an acknowledgement that despite decades of policy and practice, we really haven't been able to move very far beyond the humanitarian framework. Uh, and to respond to situations of long-term uh, uh, long exile in a manner that ensures the rights and dignity of the refugees involved. And so one of the reasons for this is that in addition to the social ex exclusion that many refugees are subject to, they are also subject to both formal and de facto legal and political exclusion. And so one of the key claims that I make in this non-existent book <laughs> is um, that refugees are unable to claim and to enjoy the full range of human rights to which they are entitled, at least in part because they lack voice and standing within the political processes of the state, because they are unable to use the law and legal and quasi-legal mechanisms to claim and enforce their rights, and because the law fails to represent their interests. So the research that I undertook for this book specifically looks at that issue. How legal empowerment of refugees can better uh, enable <coughs> refugees to claim and secure their rights in, able, in order to live with dignity, and even potentially how it can help to achieve better, durable solutions. Now obviously I can't cover you know, six years of research in 20 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to start with a very, very brief overview, uh, or just a few comments on the theoretical framework, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the legal empowerment part of this project, um, specifically outlining why legal empowerment is important, a few notes about how it can be achieved, and then what its potential contribution to durable solutions is. So as I mentioned, this book is uh, based on my doctoral research, and it is uh, primarily the product of doctrinal research. Uh, there was very little that has been written about law within refugee contexts, as opposed to law that applies to refugees. Uh, so I had to draw on a lot of research that had been conducted in other disciplines, including in development studies, in um, poverty studies, political science, sociology. Uh, and I also conducted my own field work in the refugee camp on the Thai Burmese border. So Many of my examples come from that situation, but those are examples that are representative of other <laughs> situations as well. So the first third of the book focuses on the theoretical framework uh, that I developed by combining the fiduciary theory of state legal authority, for any of you who might be in law, uh, with a modified version of the capabilities approach. So the capabilities approach, keep on pressing the wrong button here, there you go. Uh, the capabilities approach was first developed by Amartya Sen um, and then later reworked and then modified uh, by Martha Nussbaum. And its premise, very simply, is that instead of using GDP or some other economic measure, uh, what we should really be looking at in order to measure human development and well-being is what individuals are able to be and to do, their freedom or opportunity to achieve or realize important functionings, such as being educated, having meaningful work, uh, being healthy, and ultimately being in control of their own lives. Now, Martha Nussbaum uses the capabilities approach as a partial theory of justice. Uh, and she outlines a list of 10 central capabilities that are the minimum essential capabilities necessary, uh, the absolute minimum that states must ensure in order to maintain their legitimacy. Uh, I take in this book the idea of uh, the capabilities approach as a partial theory of justice, but instead of using Martha Nussbaum's list, which I find to be a little bit idiosyncratic, I substitute the capabilities that are associated with the rights contained in the International Bill of Rights. And so this, which I refer to as the human rights-based capabilities, this approach posits that the determining factor in assessing or ensuring or improving the quality of life of refugees, <coughs> or anyone else for that matter, is neither merely the rights that are granted in law, nor the minimum needs outlined in traditional humanitarian approaches, 
but the capability of refugees and of refugee communities to access and to use those rights in practice to realize a life of value. Now, using the language of capabilities rather than rights on its own forces us to focus on what individuals are actually able to be and to do on their ability to access and benefit from rights in practice. Thus, a commitment to the well-being and dignity of refugees requires that refugee policy and programming seek to increase the human rights-based capabilities of refugees, as opposed to focusing on, for instance, just increasing um, income-generating opportunities. So then the question is, given that we have this whole range of rights-based capabilities, why do I focus on law and legal empowerment, as opposed to something else that might on its face appear to be more uh, immediate, more urgent, such as the being educated or having the right to work, having adequate employment? And to this I would answer, what good are human rights if you have no way of claiming what good is the right to work if you have no recourse when your employer fails to pay? And it's interesting, I had included that particular sentence, and this morning I got an email through LinkedIn from uh, a woman in Spain who was contacting me on behalf of uh, a friend of hers who was in exactly that position, who was in a refugee camp, had been working for an aid provider, and who had not been paid for several months despite having a contract. And she was asking me, what can he do? Well, that's the question. What can he do? So, at the core of this choice to focus on law and legal empowerment is the premise that the ability to use the law and legal institutions and mechanisms is not only important in itself, but it's a critically enable, critical enabling mechanism for the realization of other rights and capabilities. Now, there, are a lot, there seems to be, in the world, a fair degree of prejudice against law and lawyers. And we, we may not like the law, always, but we can't ignore the fact that it is a critical component of society. It's one of the key forces that governs our relationships with others, particularly within a hierarchical context, as we find in a refugee camp. It's one of the most socially acceptable forms of power, but key to that is it's also a socially acceptable constraint on power. The law is especially important in the case of refugees because as non-citizens with little formal political power and no say at the ballot box, it is one of the few means at their disposal to ensure that their voices are heard by those in authority. Additionally, Law lends normative force to claims. So you have more absolute power when making a claim based on law than you do when you make a claim based on social utility or morality. And finally, the principle of equality before the law can, at least in theory, and granted this is in many instances quite theoretical, it can level the playing field. It acts as a constraint on the arbitrary exercise of power by those who have authority and helps to counteract the power imbalances that exist between refugees and citizens of the host state, aid providers, and host states themselves. And this goes back to that idea of the rule of law that everyone, each individual, is equal before the law. So in practice, um, in Refugees in protracted refugee situations, particularly in refugee camps, are subject to multiple overlapping legal regimes. Um, using the Burmese case as an example, in the Burmese refugee camps in Thailand, the first level, obviously we have international refugee law, law, international human rights law. More specifically, you have the state law. So you have the law of the Thai state. Then there's an additional set of rules that are imposed on the refugee camp, specifically by the Thai um, uh, authorities, so the Thai Ministry of the Interior. Within the refugee camp, there is our, the refugee um, governance structure itself, so the camp governance structure among the refugee community. In this case, a large percentage of the people in the camp were from the Karen uh, ethnic group, and the Karen ethnic group has its own political <laughs> the Karen National Union, which has its own set of rules and laws. 
You also had diff uh, the traditional law from Burma that some of the principles had been imported. And then you also had the different religious groups. So for instance, there was a, a small Muslim minority, which had yet another set of norms and rules that were imposed on society. So the multiplicity of legal systems can actually represent a major obstacle to achieving any sort of access to the law, in part because there's no clear division of, of jurisdiction. There's no clear indication of where you're supposed to go when you have a legal problem, who is the authority in charge, and also because many of these systems are actually really contradictory. So again, taking an example from that situation, adultery was a huge sticking point, so to speak. In the Karen um, ethnic group, in their society, adultery is a major issue, and it is a crime, and under the Karen National Union's uh, set of rules, <coughs> adultery was punished by detention, so basically imprisonment. And yet, under Thai law, adultery is not a crime. So in fact, the camp officials, when they were detaining people for adultery, they themselves were committing a crime under Thai law. So despite these multiple overlapping regimes, many refugees, or perhaps because of them, many refugees face immense obstacles in accessing legal systems, <coughs> either the refugee legal system or the host state legal systems. Um, and this exclusion may be the result of a variety of factors, including, I think I, oh, apparently I removed that. We'll get to the next one. So a variety of factors, including, um, uh, discriminatory legislation, so there is legislation that will pro uh, specifically prohibit certain groups from accessing the state justice system. Uh, policy choices, so things like uh, restricting legal aid to only certain groups. Institutional factors such as corruption or a lack of resources. Uh, or more common factors such as language barriers, the geographical distance between, say, a refugee camp and the nearest court. Um, cultural factors, financial barriers, lack of legal counsel, discrimination and bias, family pressures within the refugee community, for instance, to not involve the Thai authorities or the external authorities, and of course, a lack of legal knowledge and awareness. So the idea behind legal empowerment is that it can help refugees, or anyone for that matter, to overcome or work around many of these obstacles in order to benefit from those aforementioned strengths of the law. So legal empowerment is a critical part of an effective human rights-based approach and a necessary precondition to any functioning human rights system. It can help refugees to translate their human rights entitlements into legal claims and uh, protects refugees from instrumentalization and domination by the state and by others who exercise authority over them. From the state authorities to aid workers, UNHCR for instance, or even local authorities, refugee leaders within their own communities. So legal empowerment, the definition that I came up with, drawing primarily on um, work that had been in done in development studies, is that legal empowerment is the process through which individuals and groups become able to use the law and legal mechanisms and services to protect and advance their rights and to acquire greater control over their lives, as well as the actual achievement of that control. So legal empowerment is both a process, but it's also an end point, an end in and of itself. There are a couple of features of this definition that are worth noting. So the first is that legal empowerment is not just about legislation and about court systems. Um, it is about law and legal and quasi-legal mechanisms and institutions understood very broadly. Um, so in addition to what we normally think of, you know, the court, the formal statutes of the state, we're looking at things like alternative dispute resolution, uh, administrative systems, traditional justice systems, and this is really key because studies have shown that the vast majority of uh, the lives of marginalized groups, including refugees, are actually governed by these quasi-legal institutions rather than the formal court process. Also by engaging with uh, mechanisms and processes and bodies of knowledge that are not necessarily under the full control of the elite, 
Legal empowerment can be more responsive to the needs of individuals, of those who lack power within a society, and, but also give them the opportunity to take a more active role in those processes. And this leads us to the second point, which is perhaps the most important, and I see here that in fact they're in a different order on there, but regardless. Um, and the second point is that the key concept in legal empowerment is not law. The key concept is power. In legal empowerment, the law and legal mechanisms and institutions are being used as vehicles for modifying the balance of power by increasing the agency of individuals and reforming the opportunity structure within which that agency can be exercised. In other words, by increasing the ability of individuals to make choices, individuals or communities, and then to act upon them. A third key characteristic of legal empowerment is that although institutional reform may be part of legal empowerment initiatives, legal empowerment is primarily about people. It's about individuals and communities, and about directly addressing the needs and interests and concerns of disadvantaged groups. It's about enabling refugees in this case to be subjects in the political conversation as opposed to objects of debate and policy, to be active participants in their own lives, and to learn how to use the existing structures even if those structures are somewhat less than ideal. So finally, legal empowerment can be differentiated from traditional justice approaches, um, what is sometimes called the rule of law orthodoxy, by its broad and multifaceted approach. Instead of emphasizing top-down initiatives that are dominated by elite actors, including professionals, so lawyers like myself and perhaps some of you around the table, um, foreign experts, and instead of emphasizing a really narrow and formalistic understanding of what a legal problem is, uh, legal empowerment <coughs> strategies emphasize the agency of individuals and communities on their ability to define their own problems, on the role of civil society, and the importance of building partnerships. And to this end, legal empowerment uh, initiatives can take on a really wide variety of forms, some of which look quite legal and others tend to be things that we would most often associate with empowerment generally. Um, and so uh, a traditional rule of law approach, for instance, could be to send lawyers or legal experts from Canada or from the US to a country to help their government reform their immigration laws. That's a traditional approach. Legal empowerment initiatives tend to be much more bottom up and driven by the community seeking empowerment itself. And these can include things like public legal education, community training, uh, training community members as paralegals, mainstreaming women's rights education into um, economic development opportunities, uh, as well as more formal activities such as public interest litigation and um, law reform or advocacy. And because legal empowerment initiatives seek to function on such a variety of different levels, they actually have the possibility of touching or reaching people who are not normally um, reached or not normally affected by these more top-down approaches. And also to, uh, to affect people's lives on a much broader and more immediate level. Now one of the reasons that I chose to study the refugee camps in Thailand, aside from the fact that it's a really nice place to go do your research, um, was because at the time the International Rescue Committee, so for those of you who don't know, this is a major international NGO based in the US, they were piloting uh, a series of projects, a legal assistance uh, center project uh, in Burma, uh, sorry, in the Burmese refugee camps in Thailand. And so Mela refugee camp was actually one of the first refugee camps to ever have a legal clinic based within the bounds of a closed camp. So a closed camp is a camp where you can, there is no freedom of movement. Um, you, if for me to go into the camp, I had to not only get an invitation by an organization and their permission, I had to get a pass from the authorities of the Thai government. Um, and so it was interesting to see the variety of different 
were, uh, different strategies that the IRC was using. And the plan was that the project would eventually be taken over by the refugee community itself so that the IRC could step back and it would be self-sustaining. It wasn't there yet. Um, and so the different activities that were involved were, for instance, the IRC had trained members of the refugee community to hold um, workshops on Thai law, on international human rights law, so that people could know what their rights were within the community, that they knew what the immigration laws of Thailand were, what they had the right to do and not do. Uh, they also had trained members of the refugee communi community to act as paralegals and legal counselors. And one of the interesting things that those, uh, or roles that those people took on was also to act as monitors of the refugee dispute resolution system, so the system within the refugee community. One of the challenges was that most um, cases, because people often worked during the day, most of the cases within the refugee dispute resolution system happened in the evenings. Well, there was a four o'clock curfew, at which point all NGO workers had to leave the camp. So there was no ability to monitor or to know what was going on within that justice system. Whereas the uh, refugee paralegals, the members of the refugee community, could monitor the system report back and could see what was actually going on. They also organized training for members of um, the refugee dispute resolution system. So there was a judge, a Burmese judge, within the, uh, the camp who in fact had no legal experience whatsoever. And so they helped organize training for him. They, the IRC also provided um, information and training to local Thai officials, including local Thai judges who had had very little contact with the refugee community at all. Um, the legal paralegals, the camp paralegals, were also trained to provide sort of that first initial consultation, to provide some legal advice, and then also to facilitate liaising with volunteer Thai lawyers. Um, or Thai lawyers who had volunteered their time in the event that certain <coughs> cases actually had to go to the Thai courts. Uh, at the same time, the IRC was helping the governance committee of the camp to bring their rules into, um, into line with Thai law. So for example, that issue about adultery, that was actually one of the sticking points where they were having a really hard time negotiating and you realize the huge cultural uh, sort of conflicts that were occurring in that one point. That and uh, juvenile justice was another. That and the use of corporal punishment. So not all of these initiatives were uh, completely successful, but it does provide you a really interesting example of the sort of multi-dimensional uh, legal empowerment that has both a communal dimension, so empowering the community as a whole, but also empower empowering individuals to bring complaints against the leadership within the refugee camp as well. And so this case study draws attention to the fact that in helping to ensure that refugees are able to live with dignity, legal empowerment has a critical role to play in three different areas. This is where my PowerPoint dies. So <laughs> now you'll just have to listen to me. Um, the first is that legal empowerment has the potential to enhance the administration of justice within protracted refugee situations. And this has to do primarily with dispute resolution. Uh, so dispute resolution mechanisms, as well as access to justice and access to dispute resolution within the refugee community <coughs> itself. So refugee camps are communities, like a city here. Some of them are even big city, the size of big cities. In Mela, there were about 50,000 people. So a reasonable sized community. And as any other community, there's a complex web of interactions and relationships within the camp that are mediated by social norms, by moral norms, by religious norms, but also by law and quasi-legal norms and processes. And so a camp resident needs to have recourse if their rights are violated by the host state or by an aid provider, but they also need to have recourse when there's a property dispute with their neighbor, when there's an issue of inheritance, when there's an issue of domestic violence within the camp. Um, and statistically, 
refugees, because of their vulnerability, as other marginalized groups are as well, are more likely to be victims of crime and illegal acts. And those illegal acts are more likely to have a lasting and greater impact because they are less likely to be able to secure any sort of redress. Ensuring that you have access to a justice system or a dispute resolution system helps to ensure that there will be redress. And so legal empowerment strategies can help to strengthen justice processes within the camp, so training camp officials, train, uh, informing members of the community what their rights are. And it can also help to increase accessibility of the host state justice system and improve, critically, improve the capacity of individuals to access that justice system. And this is perhaps the most traditional or the traditionally legal role of legal empowerment. But beyond dispute resolution, the second uh, role that legal empowerment has to play is that legal empowerment has the potential to increase or enhance accountability and the governance of the leadership of refugee communities, of the host state, and of aid providers who are supplying services and assistance within refugee camps. Now, the role of legal empowerment specifically pertains to the interactions, or this role of legal empowerment specifically in, uh, pertains to the interactions between individual refugees and, or the refugee community and those who exercise power <coughs> over them. Um, often it will be UNHCR or another aid provider or local authorities within the host state, but it can also be even the a senior management uh, within the refugee community. In these cases, the real core issue is one of accountability. In a human rights context, that means ensuring that human rights are enforceable uh, obligations and not merely empty rhetoric. Legal empowerment can help to increase the capability of individuals to hold powerful actors to account uh, for their conduct or performance, as well as for the outcomes, for what they do or fail to do, and also for how they do it. This is an area where there's still a lot of work to be done. In no other field do uh, states or organizations, do service providers have so little accountability to those that they are actually providing services to. Whether it's by showing uh, members of the community how to frame rights claims in a legal context or an advocacy context, or through public interest litigation, legal empowerment can help to strengthen the voice of the public to demand legal accountability, to make legal claims, and to demand greater responsiveness from powerful actors. And last but not least, legal empowerment has a critical role to play in facilitating um, the implementation and success of durable solutions, in particular by enhancing uh, refugee participation in transitional justice mechanisms and by facilitating integration or reintegration and voluntary repatriation. So in, when it comes to integration within the host state, legal empowerment can help to create connections between refugee actors and host state authorities, making them, and host state institutions more generally, making them, the refugees that is, more visible. Um, and bringing them within the legal framework of the host state. And this is a step on the path towards some form of integration. Perhaps not full integration with citizenship, but it is the idea of making people visible and making them, bringing them into the uh, community of the host state, not merely as people who to be acted upon, but as actual individuals with equal status, with equal rights, who are able to make claims. But perhaps more importantly, legal empowerment can help refugees to acquire the knowledge and the mobilization skills and develop the capacities necessary to be fully engaged in the context of transitional justice, uh, reconciliation, and repatriation, to advocate for their own rights and interests. Uh, despite being some of the communities that are most affected by conflict and by extension, by the end of conflict, refugees are often marginalized when it comes to transitional justice processes. They rarely have a full participation, a full voice within those uh, processes. And without meaningful participation by refugees, transitional justice mechanisms are unlikely to be um, 
to address the particular needs and experiences that result from displacement, which are very different from the needs and experiences of those who remain within a country post-conflict. Um, and this failure can actually undermine uh, any efforts to promote reintegration and sustainable peace and reconciliation. Conversely, participation in transitional justice mechanisms, and not just on the criminal front, but in terms of things like property restitution or the resolution of other sorts of conflicts, um, can help to reestablish a relationship of civic trust and citizenship between the refugee and between the state that, that they have fled. And this is an essential part of a just return and successful repatriation. So these are just a few of the sort of a quick overview of some of the areas where legal empowerment has the potential to have a significant impact on the lives of refugees. And if I had to leave you with one key takeaway, um, and maybe I'm biased because I am, my background is in law, it would be to remember that law is important. Um, it's very easy to sidestep this issue when looking at protracted refugee situations. Um, ending poverty, uh, addressing you know, lack of food, addressing providing education, <coughs> providing work permits, they all seem like more tangible goals. And the end results may be much more easily measurable. But being recognized by and able to use the law opens up possibilities beyond material well-being. Legal empowerment is the specific manifestation of all of the different ways in which law matters, even or perhaps especially to people who have already lost so much. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to welcome any questions that you might have. <laughs>